for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Charlie Bean. These days, uh, partly the London School of Economics, partly the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, the two uh, speakers uh, in this session are going to be Sam Johnson uh, from the School of Management at the University of Bath. Uh, and his work uh, has focused mainly on the cognitive <laughs> science uh, of markets. Um, and then the second speaker will be Henry Brighton from the Department of Cognitive Science at Tilburg University, uh, whose research is focused on decision making in the world of uh, radical or 90 uncertainty. Uh, and then the discussant is going to be my colleague from the NSC, Nava Ashraf. Uh, her research has combined psychology uh, and economics using both lab and field experiments uh, to test insights from behavioral economics, especially uh, in the, uh, the development context. Uh, the rules are as exactly for the previous uh, panel, 25 minutes for each presentation, 15 minutes for the discussant, um, and if any of the speakers uh, overrun, they will get a prompt from my, uh, my smartphone here, uh, which will uh, play a nice little tune to keep them going. Uh, okay, so Sam. All right. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I thought the talks uh, in the first panel were very interesting, and, as well as the discussion with the audience. Um, so it occurs to me that maybe cognitive science can be a nice uh, bridge, actually, between economics and uh, more sociological approaches in the same kind of way that in the natural sciences, chemistry is seen as this kind of level of analysis that fits nicely in between uh, in between. Uh, physics and uh, biology, so you can let me know how successful I am in making that case to you today. Uh, so cognitive science is basically the interdisciplinary study of how the mind works. So actually people from many fields that are actually represented in this room uh, tend to contribute to this field. We have uh, uh, experimental psychologists such as myself, as well as uh, computer scientists, anthropologists, um, even education researchers, philosophers. It's a big tent uh, approach to understanding this really uh, deep and complex question. So uh, most of my work focuses on the way that people make sense of information. So to introduce that topic, I wanted to show you kind of a funny example, something that happened a, a couple of years ago, of course. Uh, so this is a, a chart of the S&P 500 futures on the night of Donald Trump's election. So what you can see is that right around here, as it becomes increasingly clear that Trump might actually win this election, there's this precipitous decline in the expected future value of this, uh, of this market. But strangely enough, around midnight, uh, when Trump makes his victory speech, evidently the speech is seen as you know, relatively less problematic than some of the things he'd been saying earlier. He seemed relatively gracious. He didn't talk as much about nationalism as he had been. And then actually by the morning, it's almost like nothing had ever happened. The stock market is just completely recovered to its original level. So this is very strange, right? So uh, of course, the Wall Street Journal had uh, an explanation for this in the following day's paper. And I love this explanation because it ties in nicely with the kinds of things I study. So they call this the battle of good Trump versus bad Trump. So basically what they're saying is that uh, part of what the stock market is trying to do is to predict what kind of economic policies we're going to have in the future. We're going to have good policies or bad policies. But there's this guy, Donald Trump. We don't really know, you know who this guy is, what he's going to do. So there are different possible interpretations of him you could have, different hypotheses you could say. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal calls them the good Trump hypothesis and the bad Trump hypothesis. So according to their story, uh, you're evaluating these different hypotheses based on a really scant amount of evidence. So basically, things that he puts on Twitter, things that he says in public, we don't even know for sure which of those things he wrote himself versus other people told him to say. So maybe we assign initial credences of, say, 35% to the good Trump hypothesis and 65% to the bad Trump hypothesis. So good Trump hypothesis maybe is somebody who slashes corporate tax rates in the stock market. Uh, bad Trump might be somebody who imposes uh, tariffs on China and drops a nuclear bomb on Canada. <laughs> so, uh, so what you see in the course of, uh, of this initial period when we seem to have these kinds of credences is this precipitous decline, but then maybe there's this shift, according to the journal, around the time of this victory speech, this really you know, small piece of information maybe is sufficient to actually change these probabilities and cause the market to increase in value. 
Okay, so that's the kind of processing that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, problems that take this kind of logical form uh, are really common in all sorts of areas of human thought. So when we think about cause and effect, basically we're saying, okay, here's some event that we observed. Let's try to figure out which of these different possible things caused it. Uh, theory of mind is just uh, how we interpret other people's behavior. So when somebody does something, we try to figure out what caused them to do that, which kinds of hidden mental states might explain their behavior. Um, actually, even in perception, you know, you feel as though you're just perceiving the world as it is, but actually your, uh, your retina has a two-dimensional array of information, and there's an infinite number of three-dimensional states of the world that could explain that two-dimensional state. So our visual system has developed these very sophisticated uh, routines for trying to recover uh, the best explanation in three dimensions of the two-dimensional world. Right? So really common uh, in psychology, in different kinds of processes, but these processes themselves are really important for uh, mental operations like probability judgment, predictions about the future, choices between things, uh, which of course we all acknowledge uh, underlie a good deal of economic behavior. So uh, when managers are deci uh, deciding what strategy to use for the firm, part of what they're doing is figuring out what their competitors are thinking. Uh, in financial markets, we're trying to predict what's going to happen in the future to the market. Uh, and when we're thinking about policy choices, we have to use our, our theories about, uh, about how those choices are going to affect uh, broader markets. Uh, but of course, these problems are not easy to solve. So you can write out uh, an equation if you're a Bayesian for calculating the posterior probability favoring the good Trump over the bad Trump hypothesis. It's really easy. You just, you know, figure out these four probabilities and multiply them all together, right? Uh, but obviously, uh, it's not actually not that easy because human beings face a variety of different kinds of challenges. Um, it's not just that we face cognitive limits as some kind of general, general problem, it's that we have very specific kinds of challenges that we face, uh, both because of the structure of our minds as well as the structure of the environment. So uh, how exactly did we enumerate these specific hypotheses about good Trump and bad Trump? Like, what exactly did those hypotheses entail? Why isn't it some other, uh, some other kind of uh, view about Trump? So we have, to, uh, we have to limit ourselves to a finite number of things that we're considering at any particular time. We have a really uh, limited amount of information for making these kinds of decisions. Uh, we often live in a world of uh, Knightian uncertainty rather than risk, so it might not make sense actually to assign a probability of 0.3356 to the good Trump hypothesis, as maybe this equation would suggest that we can or need to do. And we also face limits in our, uh, in our computational capacities. So, uh, I, th I think it's implausible that people can even uh, do something like this with four numbers, but in the real world, these problems, of course, are much more complex than this. Uh, so basically what I study is different kinds of mental strategies that people use for solving these sorts of problems. So uh, in some situations, like the Trump example, you could classify this as something like a causal fork, is what they call it in philosophy of science. So you observe some evidence, say what Trump put on Twitter, and you're trying to figure out whether the good Trump or the bad Trump hypothesis is the best explanation for that evidence. And so basically what I argue in my work is that people have a suite of different uh, explanatory heuristics that people use for solving these kinds of problems. These are heuristics that are probably broadly adaptive, so better than not being able to do anything, but can still sometimes lead us to make mistakes. Um, so an example of where this might be important is when you're trying to uh, infer policy intentions, say, uh, some statement that a central banker makes and trying to understand uh, what exactly uh, the best interpretation of that is. And I'll show you some evidence on this uh, in a little bit. Um, a second uh, important kind of tool uh, which came up during the first session is this idea of narrative thinking. So you have a certain sequence of events that you've observed here and then you're trying to figure out what's the best way of structuring your idea about past events to, in order to explain why this current thing happened. And then the nice thing about narratives is that they have this sort of temporal dimension. So you can think as well about how the, what this narrative implies about uh, what the future is going to bring. And uh, of course, in macroeconomics, everything is all about expectations, uh, which is exactly what narratives are, uh, are good for. Um, and then finally, uh, we also have to have general ideas about how different kinds of variables fit together. So in a situation like the macroeconomy, uh, we individual people, so here I'm not talking so much about policymakers, I'm talking about ordinary people, uh, might have specific <coughs> ideas about the ways that uh, things like economic growth and GDP and inflation and unemployment are linked together. There's actually a little bit of research on this topic. 
Um, and these theories, I'm sorry to say, are not the same as what macroeconomists tend to think. Um, so it's very important to understand, I think, how ordinary people are going to forecast the implications of different kinds of policy interventions, both in terms of predicting what they themselves are going to do, but also just in terms of, uh, of their check on, on power since they're, since they're voters. Okay, so what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to give you two case studies um, which are linking this idea of sense-making in different forms with uh, expectations. So first I'm going to tell you about uh, gray swan events. So these would be, so you, know, you all know what the black swan event is, right? That's like a Six Sigma event. It has such an incredibly low probability that we think that people basically ignore them. Well, I'm going to tell you about gray swan events. This is something that maybe has a 30 or 40% probability, something you probably shouldn't ignore. And uh, we're going to talk about whether people, in some sense, actually do ignore those kinds of events. Uh, and then second, I'll tell, tell you a little bit about how people think about price patterns. And then to wrap up, I'll give you some broad ideas about how uh, cognitive science can contribute to behavioral economics. And you can tell me how useful this actually is for macro. Okay. So this first line of work on great problems <coughs> is with uh, an undergrad, uh, Faith Hill. So, you might think uh, that people might actually account for these sorts of gray swan events. So there's a, a new-ish tradition in <laughs> cognitive science, uh, which basically says that people are properly Bayesians. They do all sorts of tasks extremely well. A good case study of this, maybe, is our perceptual systems. So our perceptual systems are basically solving the equation that I showed you all the time. Right? We, have, we can fall prey to illusions occasionally, but for the most part, we have a pretty good sense of how the world around us is structured. So maybe aspects of cognition behave like this as well. And if that's the case, we obviously have to be good at probabilities because the whole idea of Bayesian inference is that you assign probabilities to things and can reason about them, right? Um, on the other hand, there is evidence from, uh, from the psychology of reasoning that people often ignore uncertainty when they're making predictions about future events. So it's not so much that you would, uh, you know, that you deny the possibility that there's a 20% chance of rain, uh, it's that if you're actually trying to act on that information, you might behave as though a 20% chance of rain is essentially uh, impossible. So to distinguish between these two different pictures, and so I can choose you to the kind of experimental task they had uh, participants do, let's walk through the, uh, the sorts of calculations that you, might, uh, mm -hmm. that you might use if you're trying to think through this Trump example. So if you are trying to forecast the probability of good economic policy, excuse me, you would first have to calculate the probability that you're in the good Trump world and you have good economic policy. So that's, say, 65% chance you're in the good Trump world, we said. And then probably good policy is very likely if you're in that world. But then you also have to think about the possibility you're actually in the bad Trump world, but still somehow manage to get good economic policy. So maybe say there's a 35% chance you're in the bad Trump world, and then conditional on that, a 10% chance of good policy. OK, so if you do all of those calculations, you find something like 62%. That would be nice if people could reason that way. I'm assuming that people actually can think about these as point probabilities, which I don't really believe. But for the purpose of the task, let's suppose that that's what people are doing. OK, <clears throat> so what I'm going to argue is that actually, uh, people are fine assigning 65% and 35% to these different kinds of tasks, uh, at least qualitatively. But when they're actually using these numbers to make further predictions about other things, they treat them as though they're essentially 0 and 1. So people treat a probability like 65% as though it's certainly true, and a probability like 35% as though it's essentially 0. And if you do that, you end up with a very different kind of answer, and these are going to be systematically overconfident answers. So you can call that uh, a digital belief as opposed to an analog belief, because you're basically treating probabilities as 0 and 1, not as. Uh, graded uh, at a graded continuum. <coughs> so um, the experiments basically work like this. Uh, you don't have to read this. I'll, I'll tell you the key things. So uh, the task is participants are trying to predict the probability that the stock market is going to increase in value in the future. So I tell participants that they should imagine the central bank is deciding what policies to adopt. And I give them some reason to think that one of these hypotheses, the aggressive versus modest monetary policy, <coughs> Hypothesis is more likely than the other one, say, based on something that the chair said. So uh, if you actually ask people uh, to report these probabilities, they'll say something like 80% and 20%. So like I said, it's not like people are saying there's a 0% chance of modest monetary policy in this kind of task. People are perfectly happy to quantify this as 20%. Um, so in this condition, we say that uh, there's a strong link between aggressive monetary policy and uh, increases in the stock market's value. 
and a weak link between this modest uh, monetary policy hypothesis and increases in the stock market. Okay. So we're comparing participants' answers in this condition to a separate condition. The only difference is that this link is now strong, uh, is weak, rather. And we say that the stock market's not likely to increase in value either way. So the only difference is this conditional probability here. And of course, any theory is going to tell you that people are going to be paying attention to something that they said has an 80% chance of being true, right? So that's not a big deal. Uh, the key is that we also have a condition where we manipulate the strength of this link between modest monetary policy and the prediction that they're trying to make. So if you think about the predictions here, if people are thinking in an analog way using probabilities in a kind of Bayesian manner, then you should see a big effect, a big difference between these first two conditions in terms of their predictions. But you should also see some difference between the second two conditions. Because after all, uh, they said that there's a 20% chance of this happening. We're changing the link between that and the prediction that they're making. Okay, so that would be sort of normative. Uh, Instead, uh, what we're arguing is that maybe people are going to basically treat this Gray Swan event as completely irrelevant, even though they said it has a 20% chance of happening. So there's going to be no difference at all between these two conditions. So hopefully that's clear. And uh, when we do that, we see, in fact, that it's much more uh, like the latter set of predictions. And if you're worried about the statistics uh, of uh, interpreting null effects, this is uh, significantly lower than if you actually calculate what they should be, uh, should be responding to in this task. Okay, so we have a bunch of other versions of this. I'm not going to you know, show you 30 different versions of this task, but uh, you get the same thing basically if you tell people this has a 70% chance, this has a 30% chance. Uh, it's the same if you're trying to predict the price level of the stock market. So if you, instead of saying what's the probability that's going to go up, you say what do you think the value will be, it looks the same. It's the same if you're talking about individual stocks, not just the level of the stock market as a whole. And it looks like we don't have much of an effect of expertise either in this task. We thought that people who have a lot of trading experience might be uh, better at this kind of thing, but it does seem to be a kind of uh, intrinsic limitation on the amount, the number of hypotheses that we can consider at the same time. Uh, so I think this maybe has some implications for um, uh, behavioral economics and maybe for macro. So uh, I think pretty clearly this could be a source of investor overconfidence, if you're basically systematically predicting that things have higher probabilities than they really do, then you're going to be more certain about the trades that you're making than you otherwise would be. Maybe you're not going to hedge as much, maybe you're going to trade more than you ought to. So both problems that we actually observe in individual investors. Um, at the more macro level, maybe this can also account uh, in part for uh, why the uh, trading volatility uh, seems to be higher than it normatively uh, ought to be, uh, say in this uh, Schiller uh, paper. And then within cognitive science, I think of this as actually not a, a stupid thing that people do. Like in this task, it kind of looks a bit stupid. But in the real world, we often have to make uh, chains of predictions. So you're not just thinking about you know, what, the, what the central bank is doing. You're thinking about what the central bank is doing and how that's going to affect what Congress does and how what Congress does affects what CEOs do and all these kinds of chain inferences. And if you're trying to account for the level of risk at each of those different stages, you quickly find that this kind of computation is impossible to actually uh, to, to do. Um, and then finally, I alluded to the existence of uh, Bayesian cognitive models. I think those are useful, but I think, uh, I think there have to be some limits on what we can get out of them if people can't actually think uh, using probabilities in other kinds of downstream computations. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit faster about the second case study. So this is looking at how people use narratives to think about uh, the price, uh, the patterns in prices. So this is work uh, with an undergrad, Tommy Matiashvili, and with uh, David Tuckett um, at uh, University College London. So it seems like we have competing intuitions about uh, how we should predict prices from past uh, price history. So there's this intuition of momentum. So if a price has been going in one direction, it's probably going to continue going in that direction for the foreseeable future. So uh, some months ago, I had a harrowing phone call with my friend John, who was telling me all about his adventures speculating in Bitcoin, uh, basically based on this, uh, this kind of intuition that if the price has been going up, surely it's going to continue to go up forever. Okay, so I, I care about my friends. So my rhetorical strategy was to appeal to this other intuition, uh, mean reversion. So you might also think, well, if a price has been trending in one direction, it's probably just a matter of time before it actually 
reverses. So you know, this is what I appeal to, even though maybe the evidence for this as being a, a very important factor in financial markets is modest. Um, so the conjecture that I'm testing here is that maybe these intuitions coexist within the same people, and you can actually trigger either of these kinds of intuitions based on specific patterns in the past uh, history of the prices. <coughs> So we do know that people tend to linearly project past price trends. So if a price has been increasing systematically uh, uh, year on year or month on month or day on day, people tend to think it's going to continue to go in that direction. And conversely, if it's been decreasing, and this assumption is sometimes built into behavioral finance models. Uh, so the question is whether people would also match more complicated patterns than that. And there's maybe some anecdotal at least evidence that they might. Uh, so technical trading seems to be very popular. It's unclear whether it really works very well, or maybe it's pretty clear that it doesn't work very well, actually. Uh, but it seems to appeal to these kinds of intuitions. Um, and uh, once again, we have this idea that people are, uh, are gifted at telling stories and have a natural inclination to do so. So specifically, we're going to be looking at the possibility that you can trigger these reversion beliefs either by evidence that there have been reversions in the, um, in the past history of the prices uh, for a particular stock or whatever, uh, or if a commodity has been stuck at a particular price level for a while, people might think it's going to go back toward that price. So this is the, those are the very concrete things we're going to test. So uh, you don't have to look at these numbers, but this is basically what the experiment looks like. So we tell people about different companies, and we give them uh, the history of uh, prices in this company, so they only see one of these four uh, sets of numbers. I'm going to graph them on the next uh, page, so it's clear what's going on. We ask them to predict what the future value is going to be in one month, two months, three months, based on uh, data from the past uh, six months. Okay. So the y-axis is basically the proportion of the initial price. Uh, so this, uh, these five data points are just the ones I showed you now that we gave to participants. So when this has, in fact, been the price trajectory recently, then people think it's going to continue to go up uh, in the uh, immediate future in the next few months in an almost completely linear way. And that's consistent with past behavioral uh, work, and I think maybe some econometric work as well. Uh, <clears throat> however, when you, even if you have the same starting price and the same ending price for a recent price history, and I think it's also the same average price, actually, uh, people now tend to be much less inclined to predict these uh, price trends into the future. So that's if you've had a reversal in the recent past, and you see the converse pattern if there's been a negative price trend, people are perfectly happy to extrapolate that. Uh, but actually, they think the price is going to go back up if, uh, if there's been a reversion in the past. OK, and now uh, same idea, looking at uh, stable price histories. So this is just the same thing I showed you before, just a different group of people. Uh, so this is a price history where we kept the average the same between these two different uh, sets of prices, and the recent price is the same. Uh, here, people are much less likely to extrapolate the trend forward. And then actually when it's a negative uh, price change, people think it's going to bounce back up toward where it had been uh, in the past. So the basic underlying idea of this is that people are trying to seek patterns in these data. And we interpret these results using conviction narrative theory, which we heard a little bit about <coughs> in the first, uh, first part of the talk. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, yeah. do you tell them what kind of price you think that stock? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so we tell them, uh, yeah, so actually, I think on the next slide. So uh, we use uh, fake stocks, a bunch of fake stocks that we tell people that we tell them what industry the company is in and so forth. But we also do this for a ton of other different kinds of prices. So we have, a, we have one where we use a bunch of different kinds of financial goods, like bond prices. I think we did interest rates, but I'd have to, I can't promise that we did that. But I think it's true. Definitely exchange rates it works for. Um, and a bunch of different kinds of consumer goods. Did you try it without? Did you just say, yeah. get a number? Yeah, good question. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same. I don't think it's anything that specific to people's intuitions. It could be framing. Yeah, yeah, it could be, it could be a bit framing, yeah. Um, it, it's possible. I don't know whether that would change it. That's a good point. Um, so the basic idea here is that people are looking for patterns. They, uh, they tell a story about... Uh, about these patterns that causes them to have an affective reaction. So they want to either approach or avoid these kinds of patterns, and then that leads them in the downstream to make uh, uh, different kinds of choices depending on the intuitions that they have. And you see similar results, as I said, for other kinds of prices. Also, if you use real stock prices, 
Um, this isn't a comment, this is still experimental data, but if you give people real stock prices, they tend to think the same thing. Uh, it's doing an incentive compatible task. And again, it doesn't seem like there's a big effect of expertise, but I'd be a little bit less confident in making that claim. Uh, and uh, as uh, Carr has alluded to, this does indicate the possibility that there can be framing effects in the way that we form expectations about the future. So for example, uh, I gave participants these price points at, at one month intervals, but if you gave people a much more rich price history, it would look completely different than it did in what I just showed people. So this could uh, potentially have a big impact on the actual investment choices that people make, depending on how these data are displayed. If these would, of course, be lay people in noise traders. I don't think that professionals would, would have that kind of problem. Um, and it also speaks to the further to the empirical inadequacy of ra rational expectations. That's fine. Um, but it also speaks to the empirical inadequacy of models that um, tend to think that we're going to extrapolate uh, in a linear way into the future. I'll wrap up. I have one more minute, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I timed it to the second, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I just want to say a couple of things really quickly about why I think that cognitive science and behavioral economics can have a useful conversation. So cognitive science basically, it's, the whole point of it is trying to understand what's going on inside people's head, not just looking at um, overt behavior that people exhibit, that's the historical origin of the discipline. And I think that economics has maybe faced a similar trajectory, actually, where there tend to be this kind of behaviorist uh, tendency, maybe there's still some remnants of that, not thinking so much about what individual people uh, have going on in their minds. And I think that the discipline that basically has uh, the characterization of internal states as its primary objective might be something that could uh, usefully contribute to economics. And then just, uh, I want to also point out that uh, cognitive science is a discipline that is that has this big tent, listens to people from lots of different fields. Um, and I think that that kind of approach, just as the kind of conference that we're having uh, today, has the potential to really be a good model maybe for the way that economics can go forward. In the future. This is both a kind of intellectual pluralism, but uh, also pluralism in the kind of methods that people use. So that's all I have. Thank you.